morning, everybody. Well, if you're here at LifePoint for the first time, thanks for coming today. If you haven't been in a while, we are in a teaching series through the entire book of Romans. And as I have taught through and the other teachers have taught through some very challenging sections of Scripture and held up God's Word as our ultimate guide, there were no doubts times over the last eight months where uh, you heard something challenging taught and you were just like, that's right, just let them have it, just go, just, just say it. And you loved it. And some of you were like, hmm, that's challenging. I'm going to have to go search a little bit deeper. That's great. That's our goal that you go do that. And some of you might have been just like, mm-mm, no, <laughs> sorry, can't go there. Whatever topic we were talking through as we taught all the way through this, what I think is the book in the New Testament that if you're wondering, how do I walk through and discern this culture that we find ourselves in today? How do I discern uh, what I see in my newsfeed and what I read and, and, and what I hear other people saying that may or may not be a follower of Jesus? How do I discern what's right and wrong? The book of Romans is a great book for you to read, to challenge you, and to point you in the right direction for what it looks like to live a life fully devoted to Jesus Christ. And if you haven't read it, I would challenge you to start back in chapter one, read it, go on our YouTube channel and watch some of the messages over the past year to help you discern culture and what's going on in our world today. And so today, though, is not one of those where some of you will applaud and some of you will be no and some of you will be like, well, that challenges me. This is going to challenge every person in the room. Because while I may have said some things that you agree with and liked or said some things you didn't like over the past few months, Today, in Romans 14, should hit every single one of us deeply as we think about the body of Christ and other followers of Jesus that we do life with. And so, here's a big question I want to start with, because here's one thing we love in our culture and our country, our individual rights, don't we? I mean, we're ready to fight for that. Some of you are probably armed and ready to fight for that. Here's a question I want to ask you, uh, you to ask yourself today. Am I willing to give up freedom for my brother or sister in Christ? Now hold that question in your mind. Because we just heard the Apostle Paul, this is God speaking through the Apostle Paul, telling us to consider others better than ourselves. That's where he's been over the last few weeks. And today is an application of what we learned about last week, which was love. Not just any kind of love, but the kind of love that is not a feeling, it's a decision. It's called agape in the New Testament. There's several different words used for love, but this word agape is the highest form of love. It's, it's the kind of love God has for us. It's not based on a feeling, it's based on a decision to love and do and say what's in the best interest of the receiver. That's what agape is. And so what the Apostle Paul is talking about to this first century church that has huge implications for us today is this is how you apply agape love. And anytime you read or teach through the Bible, there's two things you have to understand. One, you have to look at what was the original context when this was written 2,000 years ago? What was the context in which those words were written for an issue maybe they were trying to address or solve or something they were trying to convict people of? First thing, context. The second thing is, what is the application for us today in our culture? Because we're 2,000 years after these words were written, so how do we apply this today? Well, what we're going to read today is written to a brand new church in the city of Rome in the first century, and that church was made up of two groups of people. One group would have been Jewish people who had grown up in the Jewish religion, and somewhere along the way, somebody shared the good news of Christ with them, and they said, yes, I want to surrender my life to Christ. That's one group of people. And they came with whatever Jewish baggage comes with them, whatever uh, religion that they subscribe to or whatever part of Judaism they subscribe to, that all came with them into following Jesus. And then there's another group of people, the Gentiles, who did not grow up in the Jewish religion. 
And so because of that, there was some conflict that got that came up. It's kind of like when you get married. It's two families coming together. And you can probably relate to this. Nobody does Christmas the same. It's like, what you do what on Christmas? That's ridiculous. This is how you're supposed to do Christmas or Thanksgiving or some other holiday or uh, the way you maybe uh, express frustration with each other. It may be different the way you grew up from the family that now you've created with your new husband or wife. And so you've got to bring two things together. And sometimes, especially early on, these two families, two people that have grown up very different, come together to form a new family. And there can be some butting heads occasionally, I've heard, right? (laughs) We all know that. That's kind of what was going on. It wasn't that the, the Jewish Christians were bad and the Gentile Christians were bad. It's that they had very different ways of viewing the world. And so they came together to worship Christ together and conflicts came up. And so the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write these words to help these believers in Christ interact with each other in a healthy, convicting, and Christ-centered way. And so the words we're going to read apply to people within the church. So if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus, those words apply to how we treat each other. So he's saying, within the church, within the family of God, here's some things you need to understand. So here's how he starts out, Romans 13, after he said, or in Romans 13, when he said, love each other, and here's how he starts out in Romans 14, let me show you how you're supposed to love each other. He says, Except those, except the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. The one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. Now, what in the world does that mean? I mean, why would he say that to them? I mean, he's commenting on the weak in the faith and those who are strong in the faith. And when you first read that, you think, did he just call vegetarians weak? (laughs) Like, that's, that's what he said. That's what it sounds like. But when you look a little deeper into the context, he's talking to people, one group in that, in this church would have had these very strict dietary laws. And they carried with, they carried that from the religion they had before they found Jesus and started this relationship with the Savior and made Jesus Lord of their life. They would have carried with them some very strict dietary laws, some of which would have been not to eat meat. Now, some of the, the, the pagans in the group would have had a very different view of eating meat. So they're trying to follow Jesus, but here's everybody's concern about eating meat. In that day, animal sacrifice was made to pagan gods, to idols. So you bring in the animal, uh, they slit its throat, they drain the blood out, and they said, we sacrifice this animal to this god. Well, some people saw that as a way to make some money because they couldn't refrigerate it. So they just sliced the thing up, took it to the market, put it up for sale. Well, it was a big deal to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And so some people said, because it's such a dangerous thing and it it, uh, convicts us, it goes against our conscience, we're just not going to eat meat. And then some people who had been in the world who had been Gentiles, who knew what it was like to practice this pagan religion, they didn't want to eat meat because it pulled them back into the life they left behind. And so this comes up not because eating meat was bad, but because of the background and the conscience of people who were in the body of Christ. At one point in the New Testament church, it's recorded in Acts chapter 15 that the church was given some, hey, here's some ways you can keep unity. And they kept unity by one of the things they said was, abstain from meat that has been sacrificed to idols. Not that there was anything wrong with meat because we've already learned and we learned through the teachings of Jesus that food 
all food was declared clean. So it wasn't that it was unclean to eat, this meat sacrificed to idols. It violated people's conscience, and it caused so much division. And, and some people may have gotten right back into pagan idol worship through the eating of meat. That's hard for us to understand in our culture, but that's what he's talking about. Even though Jesus said in Matthew 15, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiled them, defiles them. They would have known that, but they would have still had this, this check in their conscience, like, ah, oh, that's, that's meat. That could have been sacrificed to an idol. And this is what brings up issues that scholars call uh, open hand issues and closed hand issues. A closed hand issue would be something, I'll just give a couple of examples. One closed hand issue that we cannot be flexible on is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can't say you follow Jesus and say, I'm not sure Jesus ever rose from the dead, but I'm going to follow him anyway. Well, you know, we're saved because of our faith in what Jesus did and God saves us. So that's a closed hand issue. I will talk to you about it, but there is nothing you could ever say to change the fact that our faith is fully based on a man rose from the dead, said he was from God, said he came from heaven to earth, God in the flesh, rose from the dead after being crucified, and we have faith in that. And that's what the gospel is all about. There would be no gospel without the resurrection. So, closed hand issue. That ain't changing. Another closed hand issue would be the authority of Scripture, what we're reading today. We hold this up as the ultimate authority, which means sometimes we have to change attitudes, beliefs, and actions because of what God's holy word says. Because we hold it up as authoritative. Because if this is not authoritative, what is? If this is not where we get our authority, our spiritual authority for all of life, where else are you going to get it? On social media? From government? From people's feelings? Well, that changes a lot. This never does. And so that's a closed hand issue. Like we're not changing the fact authority comes here. If I don't like it, too bad. That's what that says. If you don't like it, you got to take that up with God because that's what this says. Authority, closed hand issue. Now there's open handed issues that we might have a conviction about, but they're not like they're not dependent upon you spending eternity with God or not. They're not dependent upon uh, somebody really following Jesus or not. Things like uh, may maybe the style of music. Maybe you grew up in a church with a very different style of music like I did. In fact, I grew up in a church that uh, there was no instruments anywhere. And so, but that, that's an open-handed issue. You could sing with them, without them. It's, it's neither right nor wrong. That's an open-handed issue. People can interpret differently and believe differently. Another open-handed issue might be the way people interpret the end of time. If you read the book of Revelation, you will get honest scholars that are good scholars that hold up God's word as fully true, but they come to different conclusions. So whether you believe that this whole thing's going to get shut down by a rapture and just like maybe only half, well, hopefully all of us wouldn't be here if that really happened, <laughs> or it's going to get shut down by Jesus just showing up and then we're, you know, with him or without him for eternity, there are different beliefs in this room on how it's going to shut down. But we all know who wins in the end. So just get on the winning team. And however the play goes at the end doesn't really matter. So that's an open-handed issue. And so what we're talking about today is some open-handed issues. It was neither right nor wrong in itself to eat meat. And he goes on to talk about special days that people uh, observed and how some days are more important. You ever meet people that celebrate a half birthday? Don't get it. <laughs> Have you? Who's met people celebrate the half birthday? We had a person on staff one time, amazing person, but they celebrated a half birthday. And I'm like, I can't remember whole birthdays. Like, what are you throwing another one in there for? But that was a very important day to them. And so they had half birthdays. 
I don't care about half birthdays. Let's just stick with the one day so we don't have to remember more. So they're also dealing with days. So I'm not going to read every single verse of chapter 14 because we would be here for a very long time. But he's talking about uh, meat sacrificed to idols and he's talking about days. So they had an issue with things that weren't necessarily wrong until they started to cause division. Here's where division comes in. Division comes in when people take either closed hand issues or open hand issues to the extreme. So if you take open hand issues to the extreme, that's called liberalism and you end up fighting for nothing. Then everything is okay. Whatever somebody feels or wants to do, that's just fine. There's no deep held convictions that are a standard that's authoritative because, hey, it's just all okay. That's the extreme of open hand issues, liberalism. The extreme of closed hand issues is legalism, where you start to take things from over in the open hand issue uh, category and you say, you know, you have to believe this just like this and do it just like this or else you're wrong. Somebody sent me a really funny video today of a pastor somewhere talking about how sinful it is for men to have beards. And I was like, all right, that is definitely an open hand issue. Thank God, right? It's an open hand issue put on the closed hand side. And so that's what was going on. They had people making things essential that weren't essential. And when that when you get towards legalism, the extreme fights over everything. The extreme on the other side fights over nothing. And Paul is simply saying, there are weak people in this church. He's saying there are weak people in this church in Rome. And you need to be willing to understand and even give up your freedom on open-handed issues to help them in their faith. That's what it means to be mature in your faith. So here's the thing about most weak people. They don't think they're weak. Weak people tend to think they're strong. So he's telling this new church to stop looking down on each other because they may have some different convictions about things. When our girls were growing up, we had a rule in our house. You don't watch PG-13 movies until you're how old? 13. And here's my thinking. If Hollywood says, that's too much for a 13-year-old. That's just too much. We should not let a kid watch. If Hollywood says that, that we would all agree is a pretty ungodly place and culture. And if they say a 13-year-old and down should not watch this, I think our standards should at least be that. And so our girls did not get to watch movies when they were 10 and 11 that all their friends got to watch, and we would share that conviction with them. Now, they had a list what they were going to do when they got 13. And they had, I'm watching this movie. We're having a movie marathon, Dad. You better catch up on your sleep. That was a conviction we had. Is it right or wrong? No, that's an open hand issue. Are you sinning if you let your kid do that? It may not be wise, but no, you're not. So here's what we learned from what Paul just said. Unity is the goal. Am I willing to give up freedom for my brother or sister in Christ? And he said, look, God's the one that's going to judge hearts. We cannot. We can judge actions. We can look at an action and say, well, that's wrong. But we can't judge somebody's hearts. And he's made that clear in the earlier chapters of Romans. But it's like he's anticipating a group of people in Rome saying, look, I have the right to eat meat and to celebrate or not celebrate this special day. Why are you telling me this? Because I have the right to do that, and these weak people can just deal with it. They can just figure it out. I'm having a hamburger, <laughs> and they can just deal with it. It's like he anticipates somebody saying that in the church in Rome, because the very next section, the very next verse says this, for none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be both the, the Lord of both the dead and the living. So remember, the context is 
different backgrounds, but they are connected in the body of Christ. So no one in the body of Christ could ever say, I am an autonomous person. And I can just, I, I don't have to, it doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter what anything, anybody thinks, because I'm an autonomous person, and if I want to do that, I can do that. Now, people out in the world can say that all day long because they don't have Jesus, and they're not connected to a spiritual family like those of us who have surrendered our Christ, ourselves to Christ. There's no autonomous person in the body of Christ. Paul has already talked about how we are all connected in the body of Christ. And it's the same today. I mean, you may not say it, but how many times are you thinking, you're not the boss of me? You are not the boss of me. Look, it's this, like the, the bond I have with my family, with my kids, with my brother, my sister, my mother, my wife. That bond can't be broken. And Paul is saying one of the relational struggles that you're having in this new church is that you're trying to live like you're an autonomous person and you're not. You're all connected. And that was a common teaching by the apostles. If you want to know, well, what does the authoritative scripture say about our bodies and what we can do with it? Paul said this to another church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. That's, that's like amen. Let me try that again. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. My body's not my own. And I don't honor God with my body because I want to earn his love or earn his salvation. I honor God with my body because I want to give honor to the one who created it. So he goes on to say, verse 15, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. And the word for love is agape. You are no longer acting in love towards that brother or sister. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know, to, know is good to be spoken of as evil. There's nothing wrong with eating meat. But he's saying, don't let that be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. So he's talking about the kind of love that is a decision and not a feeling. See, if you're not willing to give up something that causes your brother to stumble, you're not acting in love. I mean, how could you be? How could you say, I want to do what's in your best interest, so I'm not going to do that for you. I know it makes you stumble. Too bad. You got to get over it. And then here's how Paul concludes. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it's wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. The word for wrong right there, if you look up the original Greek word, is, is the same word for evil. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that causes your brother or sister to fall. This is about personal responsibility I have to keep unity in the body of Christ and to help those who are struggling with issues in their faith to help lift them up and not tear them down. Here's what he's saying. Do you really want to destroy unity in the family of God so you can eat meat? Is that you really are that willing to destroy unity and your brother or sister for whom Christ died just so you can eat meat? And Paul's pulling out all the stops. He's calling it evil. So how do we relate to that today? Like a lot of us are going to go have a hamburger afterwards today. Or we're going to dig into a big juicy steak. And that's probably not going to offend people with their faith. So that was very culturally specific to be talking about meat. What could we use today to apply the principle that Paul is talking about. Because what he's saying is, followers of Christ give up freedoms for the sake of unity. All food is clean, he's saying. You can have all the meat you want. But if it's, when you're with people, when you're around people that are offended by that or struggle with that, why would you exercise your freedom in a way that causes people to stumble? 
The closest thing in our culture that we could relate to that in the way our culture is today is alcohol. Like, whoa, whoa, hold on. I was with you on the meat in the days, but what are you talking about? I'm talking about alcohol. That's the one thing that, do you have freedom to drink alcohol? Well, yeah, I mean, there's nothing sinful about you having an alcoholic beverage. The, the Bible never says you can't take Scripture and prove that it's sinful to have an alcoholic beverage. It is sinful to be drunk. It is sinful to drink to the place where it impairs your judgment because that's what the Holy Spirit is for, is to give you judgment. And then when you consume or take or smoke or whatever, something that impairs your judgment... Yes, that's sinful. But how can we take this thing that's not necessarily evil in itself and turn it into something evil? Well, here's a question. Would you be willing to give up alcohol to prevent a brother or sister from stumbling? I'll let you think about that for a minute. Would you be willing to give up what you have the right to do to keep a brother or sister from stumbling? I could share story after story after story of somebody said, it's just one drink. And here I am going through addiction recovery. It's just one drink. And, and, and now I've made somebody stumble or I've done something I can't undo. There's story after story after story. We used to have, um, we used to have a Bible study called Beer in a Bible. We did. We did. We, do we have the right to do that? We do. We have this Bible study. It's called Beer in a Bible. But here's what happened to Beer in a Bible. The wrong people started showing up. And it wasn't just beer in a Bible, it was beers in a Bible. So we stopped it because it was making people stumble. And, and here's our decision, never again will you see that advertised because it made people stumble. Even though having an alcoholic drink is not a sin and you have the freedom to do it, exercising our freedom to say and do that caused people to stumble and we stopped. I can remember... Small group leaders years ago, no longer here, upset because we said, uh, don't serve wine at your small group. Why not? What's wrong with it? I like it. Because you don't know who's coming. They think they're coming to a Bible study, and you break out the wine or whatever, and you've got an alcoholic that's trying to recover and put that behind them, and you just put the biggest temptation in front of them. If you're tempted over something, you probably don't go there. So what you did was just put the biggest thing you could in front of somebody that's going to fall because of it. That's what Paul's talking about. You may not like that. It may make you feel uncomfortable. But that's what he's talking about. There were probably people in the first century going, I don't care what he says. I got the right to eat meat because I like it. He, they would have been right. But you don't have the right to offend someone or hurt someone that's in Christ, in the church, trying to live out their faith but have some personal convictions about a specific issue. That's a right you don't have. Now, you might think it's too bad it's somebody else's problem. He's saying, don't exercise your freedom in such a way that causes somebody else to stumble. See, if, if you're saying, no, I'm going to do that anyway, then you have a problem. You have a problem with pride, selfishness. When you, don't, when you look at God's word and you're saying, I'm not going to do what it says. And you have a problem with rebellion. I mean, understand, like, like if you're like, well, we had wine with dinner last night. Was that wrong? Of course it wasn't wrong. I'm talking about causing your brother or sister to stumble. And asking the question, what am I not willing to give up for the sake of my weaker brother and sister? There's just something I'm not willing to give up. That's an area where you need to change, whatever that is. So he ends this section, he ends chapter 14 by saying this. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. He's telling us how to love each other. If I know you have a problem with something that I, I'm not going to do that in front of you on an open hand issue, I would never do that in front of you. I, personally, I don't ever consume alcohol, so that one's not going to be a problem. But if I knew that somehow eating something that I liked offended you, when I'm around you or any context that anybody would be, I wouldn't do it. 
I, wouldn't, I, I, would, I would never do that to intentionally know that I'm putting someone in position where their faith is harmed. See, the goal for Paul is not to make up more rules here. It's to have more unity in the church. And I think more than ever today, the church needs unity. So here's three things I want you to take with you. I've said a lot of stuff. So if you're not mad at me and you're still listening, here's what I want. Here's three things. We're all in different places in spiritual growth. All of us. Now, some of us have conquered issues in our lives and some have not. Be aware that not everybody is where you are. And be willing to give up freedom in order to prevent others from stumbling in the church. Because there's something that offends you that you're glad people don't do around you. And what if they all of a sudden said, too bad, you got to get over it. I'm doing this anyway. Exercise. The second thing is exercise my freedom with caution. Just because you can do something doesn't mean it's right for you to do it. Just because you can doesn't mean it's always right to do it. And love others with biblical love always. With a decision to love them and do what's in their best interest. If we just grasp that one concept, there's so many issues that would just go away and fade into the background because we're loving other people in the body of Christ the way Christ loved us. Did what was in our best interest even when we didn't know it. And that's what we do for others. Let's pray. God, we're committed to teaching, reading, and publicly declaring your word, even when it's not easy. God, I pray for every person in the room that was convicted and needs to change the way they act or look at people in their life who may be struggling with weaker faith. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank